the show starts in three, two, one, go. Good morning, Kane Sport. It's February the 8th, 2023. I'm Gary Furman, the publisher of Canesport.com, joined this morning by Matt Shodell, our managing editor, and Stephen Wagner, as we discuss the news of the day, presented once again by Life Wallet, where the time is now to take charge of your personal health and uh well guys we've got a defensive coordinator in in uh in the boat uh i know that made a lot of people happy to uh see that and uh, see that story uh i guess about midday yesterday when we uh broke it on canesport.com and um it seemed to be a celebration amongst the canes nation that flocked to our website to read about the new coordinator and uh, our message boards to talk about it. Uh, so let me start with that this morning. Um, Lance Gidry uh, is, is a guy that has been around for a long time, a lot of different stops throughout his career, and most recently had been at Marshall and had accepted the defensive coordinator position in the last few days, really. I mean, he's, I guess he's been there for about a week or two. Uh, but they just announced it two days ago that he was going to be the defensive coordinator at Tulane. And uh, that just happened to coincide with um, Kevin Steele's decision to go to Alabama and be the defensive coordinator there and leaving Mario Cristobal with an opening. And Mario doesn't care that, you know, uh, that, that he had just been introduced at Tulane the day before. That was the guy that he wanted. And uh, Mario goes way back um, with Lance and, and has competed against them at, uh, at different times through the years, particularly when he was the head coach back at FIU. And they used to go against Lance's defenses every year. And um, I, from what I remember, I know they had some pretty good battles back then. And, you know, Lance has continued to progress. And now he is one of the more innovative defensive coordinators out there uses a lot of exotic formations. He's very aggressive. He likes a physical defense. They are very much aligned, Mario Cristobal, Lance Guidry, in what they like and what they are going to be looking for on the football field. Uh, So in that sense, this is kind of like a marriage made in heaven. Um, Matt Shodell, you had a chance to spend an enormous amount of time looking at defensive tape of Lance Guidry at, at Marshall. Uh, you put together a spectacular story breaking down his schemes. Tell us a little bit. I know I'm being more complimentary than usual, but uh, tell us a little bit about your thoughts on what Miami has landed here with its new defensive coordinator. Well, first I want to apologize. Um, I know people want to see Zuby here. They don't want to see me here. I don't want to be here any more than you don't want me to be here. Okay. So let's get that out of the way first. Um, you know, the thing that stood out to me most about Lance Gidry is um is when you watch the film, there was this fantastic video of him firing up his team with his Cajun Louisiana accent, you know, yelling, we're a team of damn gladiators with the accent, which for some reason I found funny. But, you know, I, personally, as a, as a classics English major in college, you know, I would never use the gladiators analogy with a football team because one of every five of them died, you know, every fight. So... Eh, not, not the best analogy. Luckily, he's a better coordinator than he is an analogist. Um, you know, I mean, I, I'm just hoping he gets down here and, and tells the players, blimey, me, I'm knackered. You know, do some British stuff with his Louisiana accent, stuff like that. Uh, but in terms of just on the football field, a lot of pre-snap movement, a lot of dropping guys, blitzing guys, trying to confuse the offense. Leaves his cornerbacks on an island an extraordinary amount of time, which reminds me of Manny Diaz a little bit. The difference between and Manny Diaz, believe it or not, was a, was a fine defense coordinator. The difference between Lance and Manny Diaz, and I know no one wants to hear a comparison, but both of them are completely willing to leave their outside boundary corners one on one with any receiver in the country. I, I saw that over and over again on the film. Not every snap, but there will be a lot of opportunities for other teams to try and get their wide receiver to run straight down the field past one cornerback with no safety help. It's going to happen. Uh, he tries to make up for that by just confusing the heck out of a quarterback for when there is going to be safety help, when there won't be safety help, who's blitzing from where, trying to get the quarterback's eyes all over the place, can't figure out where the next guy's coming from. The center can't identify who, who's blitzing, who's not blitzing, you know, who's even the middle linebacker in certain formations. 
things like that. And, you, you know, I, I specifically studied the Notre Dame game from last year because Notre Dame had a, had a good enough offense. They weren't a great passing offense, but they had, they had a good running game. And they averaged, I think, 31 points a game. They were good. And, and it's Notre Dame, right? They're, they're at a little different level uh, than Marshall. So, so when you see his defense with the players they recruited and what they did to Notre Dame with the four-star players, for the most part, and five some five stars that Notre Dame has, uh, you really get a sense for how good a hire this is. Uh, you know, notwithstanding his accent, which I think some players might laugh when he starts yelling stuff and getting fired up. I mean, it's going to be a little hard for a guy from Miami, like, you know, to not be like, how is this guy? Like, just picture a guy yelling in a British accent. It's not British, but picture, you know, one of those British, you know, stand-up guys, whatever, like a comedian, just like getting really mad and yelling in that British accent. Like, it's a little weird to me. Uh, it's going to be a little weird. Miami guys will have to just keep their straight faces and just get fired up. Uh, like the Hilltoppers did when he went on his big rant that I saw on Twitter uh, that included, of course, we're a team of damn gladiators. Uh, he did not say, blimey, I'm knackered. Although I'm hoping he will now take that if he's watching this video. Please use that a lot. Uh, so anyway, yeah, great. And, in my, and look, you know me, I like hate, I hate, hate, hate just getting average guys. I think this is a great hire. Uh, I like aggressive defensive players because I think that's the kind of guys that local... Uh, South Florida players want to play for the top cornerbacks in the country will want to play in this defense because they can showcase themselves. This is no more, you know, of like, you know, cover three and safety help over the top and all this other stuff. This is really great for cornerbacks. If you're a top cornerback in the country, you're going to want to play in this defense. And you know what? If you want to get after the quarterback and you're uh, a safety or a linebacker, I mean, he's blitzes these guys a lot. You know, it's, it's, it's basically a four, two, five, but there's always it's, it looks like a four three when you look at it. It's a four two five, but it's a four three because there's always a safety or, or an extra you know star or linebacker whatever you want to call it who's going to be in the box. There's always going to be seven to nine guys in the box pretty much unless it's a third and long. And um, from what I saw, I think he's brilliant. You know, you guys can go through what I wrote about yesterday, but like I'll give you a quick example. Um, like um, I'm trying to think of a good one. <laughs> so like if there was a fourth and four against Notre Dame early in the game. From, I want to say, the Marshall 31. Do you remember which play I'm talking about, guys? I think it was from the Marshall 31. I mean, I remember watching the game, but there were so many plays. You're going to have to play. I know. All right. So and it, was, it was a clip in the in the story I did yesterday. So it was fourth and four. And what was brilliant about what he did was, okay, he left his bound. It was a four-receiver set. He left his boundary. Um, he left his boundary corners ISO one-on-one -on -one, down the field, whatever. He's like, fine, you can have it. You know, if you're going to hit a deep shot on me, go ahead and hit a deep shot on me, which I love because you know what? Make the other team earn it. Don't give them something cheap. Uh, then he appeared to be doing a, a, an all-out blitz, you know, seven guys coming at you, but he dropped off uh, the left end and then he wound up dropping off a linebacker who was blitzing on the right side. And that guy's responsibility was what I hate when the defense coordinators never do it, which is look for the running back outlet pass because you know these offenses and these fourth and short, fourth and three or fours, they or third and three and fours even, they love to drop back and then, oh, is this the play, Gary? This yeah, this is the play. Yeah, 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 this is the play. So look at the guy on the right side. You see how he dropped back even though there was nobody from the cover, right? That he, he was not a focal point of the play, but he prevented that easy screen pass from happening that happens so often against Miami, which is just a gimme. You know, when that running back or that tight end comes out of the flat after you take your three or five step drop and gets the easy first down. Um, but anyway, Gary's running through all the different gifts that I, uh, yeah, we, got, for, we got a minute or two of highlights there. And I, you, yeah. You, I mean, you, you, you have to, you have to them all down for me to talk about it. But basically yesterday I ran through all them in detail, what was happening. And it's a very complex defense. It's nothing that's constantly the same except for, Two plays in a row that Notre Dame ran, which that was uh, one of them, and this is the next one, where the quarterback ran the ball on a keeper, and they're both identical back-to-back -back plays. And this is the only thing that I could really fault him with. He, They lined up in the exact same formation twice in a row on a, on a RPO quarterback keep, where both the short side of the field, and they both succeeded because he didn't change his defense after the first one that gained 13 yards. So Notre Dame ran the same exact play twice, and they're lucky that the second one didn't break for a touchdown, if not for a defensive end really having great pursuit in the play. It would have. Uh, you know, so that sort of thing, like, you know, there, look, no defense coordinator is perfect, but that was an issue. So, you know, and that, yeah, and that was a good interception there. But but that was um, a sign that 
you know, the quarterback run, he could be susceptible to that. Because from the Notre Dame game, all I saw uh, that was a problem, that was problematic, was the quarterbacks had, I don't know, around 80 or 90 rushing yards. Uh, they did cause some problems on the RPO game where he doesn't really, like, he doesn't really stress, it doesn't appear, over the quarterback run. He's more focused on, you know, attack the running back first, attack the quarterback in the pocket. And then once the quarterback's out of the pocket, there might be one guy to try and chase down a quarterback, and that's about it. And it's not a spy. It's a guy who was either dropping in zone or just got, like, caught out in the wash. And, uh, you know, it's not ideal. But, but look, aggressive defense, I, I really do like what I saw. Looks like he's got some Manny Diaz elements there. Like that's I, what I was trying know, to say. Yeah, I, I, don't I, wanna, totally agree. I don't want to say it too much because, you know, yeah. but he blitzes probably. He blitzes a lot. I think Manny still blitzes more than he does. But they both have a tendency to be extremely aggressive. Um, not one of these bend and break, make the offense earn it. They're, they're saying, hey, you come beat us. They're saying, hey, if you throw a 90-yard touchdown, great. But we're going to make you throw the 90-yard touchdown. Like, you know, I mean, we're going to be in your face. We're going to be pressuring you like crazy the entire game. You will never be comfortable in the pocket. And if you beat our corners one-on-one, -on -one, you know, good for you. Uh, there could be, just knowing what I know about Miami's cornerbacks and the ACC, there could be some big plays against Miami this year. But by the same token, Miami's not playing like a ton of amazing quarterbacks. I think there's maybe two or three. You know, um, you know, I don't even think the Clemson guys necessarily proven yet. I know he had a couple of great games at the end, but you know, you, you look at the FSU quarterback, um, North Carolina, of course. And outside of that, like, you know, uh, is there one more? I think there might be one more I'm missing. But there's three, maybe three quarterbacks that will, you know, really expose you on downfield passes regularly. Other than that, and, and you know what? In those games, he may have to alter what he does. But other than that, his defense is going to excel against the offenses that Miami's facing, in my opinion. All right, let's take a look at the results that he had. At Marshall, and I, I like this graphic because it covers up Matt. So you, you guys get a minute here where you don't have to look at Shodell. Uh, but first and third down defense in the country, second in stop rate, whatever the heck you know that means. I don't, you know, that's a goofy kind of stat. Stop rate. What, Stephen? You know what stop rate is? I'm pretty sure it means the percentage of drives that don't end in points. Okay, so there you go. 78.4% don't end in points. Second in the country. Uh, third in passing defense efficiency. Fifth in rush defense. Sixth in scoring defense. And passes intercepted. Oh, and I and I, I skipped over turnovers gained. Um, they were fifth as well. And they were also third in, in yards per play allowed at 46 Eighth in total defense in the country, ninth in first down defense, twelfth in defensive touchdowns, sixteenth in team sacks, nineteenth in red zone defense, twenty second in tackles for a loss, and fumbles recovered, twenty seventh in passing yards allowed, twenty ninth in fourth down defense, which is kind of like a meaningless stat because you don't even know how many uh, fourth downs people even have. But the point I think of these stats that we're showing you here is that this is a guy that ran a defense. That excelled in just about every category. And um, Stephen, I'll flip over to you. Um, you're a stat geek, I know, um, for your entire life. And, you know, when you look at these stats that we've got up on the screen, do you give how much meaning do you give them? I think it's definitely worth something. But simultaneously, you also have to consider uh, the fact that you know, for his entire life, this is his first power five gig. Um, it, you know, so the personnel's going to be a lot different. It's going to be a lot different. Uh, I think we're going to see, um, you know, some, some more advanced play styles, uh, more generally, he's obviously going to have better personnel, uh, than he's ever had. And pretty much every single coordinator that ends up getting hired in the coaching ranks they get their first power five gig because they previously had success at a lower level. And I think something that we've seen a lot of these guys who have success at lower levels that end up maybe not having the same success uh, at a higher level is they kind of change their play style. You see coordinators who were very, very aggressive at lower levels, they get up to, you know, say a Miami and they're suddenly afraid of bringing that same level of aggression because they know, you know, hey, if I stick to this exact same script of putting seven, eight guys in the box, 
and my corners get absolutely torched, even though that is my identity, I'm going to have a lot more people criticizing me and coming for my job and saying that I need to be fired as opposed to if I just, you know, play a, a much more traditional style of defense that's not so susceptible to criticism. And we've seen, you know, both offensive and defensive coaches, um, you know, kind of fall to this uh, throughout college football history, really. You see offensive coaches, um, you know, kind of be afraid to be themselves, you know, maybe have as many run tendencies or as many pass tendencies um, at higher levels as they did at lower levels because at lower levels you have a little bit less to lose. And quite frankly, at Miami, all of the eyes are going to be on him all the time. This is a fan base that has championship expectations, and rightly so. Um, and I think they're going to they're going to expect to uh, to get this turned around quickly. Um, that being said, I think if he sticks to his identity, and I think if we see a lot more of this really aggressive blitzing defense. Um, that really thrives on quarterback pressure and uh, putting quarterbacks in uncomfortable situations where basically the quarterback has to beat you with their legs, um, then I think they will be all right. Um, I do like the hire. Uh, he's obviously a, he's obviously a coordinator that's very well respected, a guy that Cristobal knows himself, a guy that Cristobal actually coached against. Uh, so there's a lot of familiarity there. Um, you know, it, Probably not going to see you know, a, a drastic change in terms of how personnel are actually used. Uh, but I think the biggest question is just going to be, uh, are we going to get the same hyper aggressive guy uh, that we got at Marshall here at Miami? The thing I've heard about him is players like to play for him. He puts them in good positions to make plays. Uh, he likes to be aggressive. He likes to be physical. And um, the players seem to embrace his style and Miami players are going to like playing that way. I think of guys who might thrive in this scheme, you know, James Williams, Ruben Bain, uh, Ruben Bain seems tailor made for some of these type of schemes that he's going to be rolling out there. Uh, so it's going to be exciting to, to see how this comes together uh, here in the spring. And then in the fall, I think that this is a good move and situation for Mario Cristobal. Uh, I think whatever the reason was, and we could you know sit here and talk about all of our opinions on it, but it didn't really work great in year one. They only won five games, um, neither offensively or defensively, quite frankly. I mean, it wasn't just the offense and Josh Gaddis. I mean, they lost some games because the defense was giving up big plays and we're having a lot of coverage busts and guys weren't on the same page. And I think it's good that they can change it up a little bit here. Um, and it's all positive. Steven, uh, recruit reaction. Uh, we have a story on the website this morning uh, with recruits reacting to this new defensive coordinator hire. Uh, you had the chance to talk to several kids uh, yesterday about the coaching transition on the defensive side of the ball at, at Miami. Um, give us a little summary about the mindset that you feel you found in talking to some of those defensive recruits uh, about Lance Gidry. Yeah, I spent most of yesterday afternoon just trying to track down as many recruits as I could, kind of get their initial thoughts, their initial reactions. And something that I kind of consistently ran into was, man, I really don't know a ton about the guy. You know, I haven't really had a chance to develop an opinion on him. Uh, there were a few kids who did know uh, who he was. They kind of knew his reputation at Marshall. And, uh, you know, a lot of this did center around, you know, seeing that Notre Dame win. Um, where they held Notre Dame to, I think it was 13 points or something like that. And they kind of saw the Marshall defense play and they kind of got a little bit of an idea for who he is and what he's about. But a lot of kids, you know, quite frankly, they hadn't watched Marshall and they weren't hyper familiar with, you know, his schemes, his tendencies, his reputations and all that stuff because he is coming uh, to, to Miami from – uh, group of five and from in some cases uh, FCS experience you know you look at kind of some of the stuff from uh, from McNeese State but more generally and overall I found that this really isn't going to be uh, a hire that's going to kind of lean players one direction or another uh, I thought Zaquan Patterson really said it best uh, whenever I asked him what his thought was, and he basically said, you know, I'm, I'm, if Coach Cristobal trusts him, I trust him. And that, to me, 
is both kind of a good thing and a bad thing because on one hand, it says that players are coming to the program to play for Mario Cristobal. They're not coming here to play for a coordinator, which you know I think is always a good thing because the most stable position on any staff is going to be the head coach. Uh, the head coach is going to be the last one to get fired, and if he's the first one to get fired, well, you know, you kind of got a problem there too. Uh, but you know, these guys consistently are saying Cristobal's the guy that I'm coming here to play for, and I found the exact same thing uh, whenever. I was doing the recruits reaction story uh, after Josh Gaddis departed Miami a few weeks ago. They said, you know, I'm not coming here for Gaddis. I'm coming here for Mario Cristobal. But on, uh, you know, on on the other hand, at the same time, uh, they're, it also means that they're kids who are kind of, you know, hey, you know, Kevin Steele's leaving for Alabama. And kids kind of go, huh, I'll be damned. Or they go, hey, you know, don't you hear we're getting Lance Gidry? And kids go, oh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, you know, like uh, none of these coordinator shakeups I found have really moved the needle as far as a lot of the uh, as far as the way a lot of these kids feel in recruiting. That being said, of course, there obviously are some who do feel that the needle has been moved a little bit. I talked to one kid uh, yesterday, Eric Brantley Jr. He's a he's a Colorado commit, a three star defensive lineman from Georgia, and he said, "Yeah, you know, Coach Steele's departure." did kind of affect me a little bit. Lance Gidry's hire didn't really affect me that much, but seeing that Steele left actually did affect me a little bit because he was the guy who came here, who recruited me, who saw me in person, who watched my workout, all of this stuff. And all of a sudden, you know, he's gone, he's at Alabama. Uh, and so I'm going to need to develop a little bit better of a relationship with the existing coaches, with the coaches that are staying, in his case, Coach Salavea. Uh, he's going to need to develop a little bit of a better relationship with him uh, before he really finds himself, you know, locked in um, and, you know, really locked in on Miami. Um, so long story short, more generally, this isn't really moving the needle. Uh, everyone does definitely recognize the importance of a good coordinator hire. Uh, he does seem to be a pretty well-respected coordinator uh, from the kids who really do know something about him, but it seems to me that more kids are really just kind of saying, all right, I need to I need to learn about this guy. I need to develop an opinion of this guy. And so, you know, I talked to a couple of kids who said, yeah, I'm going to watch his film. I'm going to go back and I'm going to, you know, take a look at his schemes. I'm going to look at his coaching history and I'm going to, you know, really start to develop my first impression. All right. And the offensive coordinator search continues. Um, Jason Kendall has not yet taken the job. Uh, so we'll continue to monitor that here as we move forward and maybe another candidate or two start to emerge. All right, we have a few more stories to talk about today, but first let's hear from our friends at LifeWallet. I know what you're thinking. Why do I get to star in my own commercial? Well, I was LifeWallet's first female athlete. So let me be the first to let you in on a little secret on how I've grown my NIL. Introducing LifeWallet Sports, a revolutionary platform giving athletes complete control over their NIL opportunities, connecting athletes to brands and businesses specific to their followers' likes and interests. And if that's not enough, this platform also helps athletes make connections outside their sports. So let's get connected on LifeWallet Sports. Take it from me, it's a hole in one. All right, so this morning on the website, there's also the continuation of our series looking at the talent depth across the board for the Canes. And that continues today with the defensive line, which is now gonna be working in the new system. So what is there to work with at the DL position? Don't miss Matt's analysis of this one. And uh, Matt, you know what? You've been so patient sitting there, minding, minding your own business, so to speak, totally expressionless, just uh, experiencing the greatness of Steven uh, for the last uh, several minutes. Uh, so we'll give it back to you. Uh, tell us a little bit about the defensive tackle breakdown and what people will see in that. Well, it was defensive line breakdown, but I wasn't, expressionless it was my it was it was an expression of shock that Stephen wasted his time talking to recruits about 
a coordinator, let's face it, that Miami recruits don't know who he is. And the truth is, <laughs> it doesn't matter if they study him or not. All that matters, signing days in December, they have September, October, November, and they're going to pretty much come to games and see exactly what this guy's doing. That's what matters. They can all commit to Marshall tomorrow. I'm not going to be worried about it because I think once they see what he's doing in season, that will tell them everything they need to know. I anticipate him doing really – I anticipate him and this defense doing really, really well. Uh, I think he'll be an excellent you know, recruiter despite um, not being from down here and uh, you know, having an accent that some might find humorous. I, I, maybe I shouldn't belabor that. People probably don't like that. But <laughs> I just can't get over watching the video of him yelling in the accent. Uh, but anyway, listen, September, October, October, November, that's when we'll find out what he's all about and if recruits are going to want to play for him in his scheme or not. Because let's face it, recruits honestly go to colleges um, for, uh, for their position coaches. They're not, you know, just like a regular student. A regular student is, is going to college, you know, for their professors and their degree, not for the dining hall food, you know? So, you know, not to make a bad analogy, but, you know, Lance Gidry is dining hall food. And, uh, you know, the position coaches are the professors. So that's the way I see it in terms of recruiting. Uh, so on to the defensive line. Uh, it's It was a weird exercise for me because I'm, I'm doing an analysis where we're, again, not to belabor, but we're not doing like co-first teamers. Like we're projecting who we really think will be first team and second team at each position. And then we're, uh, and by we, I mean me, because I'm the only one that really matters, apparently, at Kane Sport. So I am assigning a grade to uh, the defensive line talent, and I am assigning a grade to the defensive line depth. And in this case, it was super weird for me to do it because I felt like the depth was an A, and I felt like the talent was a B, which was weird for me because, you know, how can you have great depth without talent. It, it didn't make sense. But when you, when you read what I wrote, it will, it will somehow. Well, it, it, it's called having a lot of bodies, but not having a, an it, established it, elite players. Okay. Well, you know what it comes down to? I decided, thank you, Gary, for interrupting what, what was my story well, by myself. You're speaking a bunch of gibberish. Somebody has to translate. Yeah. The, the, the reason the depth I think is so good is not because of what you said. It's because these young guys they have are going to be, I think, really, really good. You know, Ruben Bain, Collins and Chiampong, um, you know, even, even last year, Cyrus Moss will put on weight and he'll be really good down the road. And, you know, Josh Horton, I'm not going to go down every single guy that they signed with a redshirt freshman, but those are guys who I don't think we can list right now as being top talent guys. You can't, obviously you can't, right? But you've got, I think, six guys who played a decent amount of reps last year returning. Two of them are really good. Mesador and Taylor. The rest are like okay. You know, Jafari Harvey, I'm not anointing him, you know, the Stephen Wagner of recruiting as a football player or anything like that. He's not the greatest in the world yet. Maybe he'll get there. Uh, and, and guys like that. <laughs> and guys like that. So, so two great, in my opinion, great defensive linemen. I think Leonard will be great. And I think Akeem Mesador already is a, a first team all ACC level player. Uh, but two's not enough, you know, when you're playing six to eight guys on the defensive line. But when you look to the future, when you look at the entire depth on the defensive line, I, I really think the depth is amazing, which is why, you know, Matt Chodell doesn't give out A's, you know. A for Matt Chodell usually stands for a curse word that starts with um, with your butt. So, uh, you know, so that's a good grade. A is a good grade. Stephen Wagner, I, I just try to get Stephen Wagner to cover his face every show, just like last show when I talked about somebody who appeared dead in a body bag. <laughs> Covered his face. Do as not as get me started on that. Me and Zuby had a text exchange about this. <laughs> I'm not doing my job if you don't cover your face once a show. I did my job. Can I go? Can I? Can I go? Like get my breakfast now? Like I'm. I'm done. I did my job for the day. I just. I just cover my ears. <laughs> <laughs> so you're done. I mean, what else do you want me to tell you? Ask right. another question. I, I mean, I'm done with that. All right, I well, just can't believe I'll, that I met someone who graduated from college with a degree in classics. All of the classics people I knew in college were people who really just hated their lives and ended up just transferring into, I don't know, communications or something. So I don't know. I, 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 just I, didn't want to, I, I tried to say it nicely, okay? So even, I tried to say it nicely. I was actually a double major because I'm a nerd, okay? It was English 
in classics. Okay, I was oh. a double major. I was initially just going to minor in classics, but I was like two classes away. And being the nerd I am, I'm like, I'd rather have a major than a minor. You know, I don't, I don't want to be like that guy who's like, I went to Harvard. I didn't go to Harvard. But like saying you were a double major is rude. Now you made me say it because I have to defend myself against you saying I'm just a classics major. I'm not a classics major. I'm an English major who just happened to wind up a, a, a classics major. I'm an English major who just happened to wind up a classics major. I'm the guy who went in to take – I took Greek, okay? I took ancient Greek, and the professor literally said on the first day of class, just so everybody knows in the class, this is ancient Greek, ancient Greek. If you're here because you want to learn Greek because you're traveling there in a couple of years or next year and you want to be able to speak to people, they don't speak ancient Greek there anymore. And I kid you not, two kids got up and left the class. <laughs> okay? <laughs> I was not one of them. I majored in the classics and I took ancient Greek and I know Latin. Like these are things that will never help anyone. So I agree with you, Stephen, to be a classics major. You're probably a depressed person because you spent four years of your life, if you're only a classics major, which I technically, I guess, am, Learning Latin, learning ancient Greek, reading like Socrates and Plato, learning about why gladiators are getting murdered when football coaches are telling their football players to be like a gladiator. I mean, it was, it was a little weird. I went to Rome. I saw the ruins. There's nothing left for the classics majors. You go there and it's like, where's all the stuff that I learned about? It's just crumbled into ruins. You know, like there's nothing left for us, which is why I'm really an English major who just, again, happen to also be a classics major okay but yeah I feel like we, classics majors are very unhappy people i agree with you stephen wagner i feel like we finally figured it out matt does in fact enjoy being miserable this is <laughs> this this is something that has you, layers to you you joined the morning show way too late i already explained this i'm gonna do it just very briefly for you stephen bring you up to speed on how life works the less you expect from life and the more miserable you are any little thing that's better than what you expect will make you happy. So by being miserable, you're actually having a positive outlook. I can't say it any simpler than that in two sentences. If you don't understand it, become a classics major. They will explain it to you. <laughs> so, Stephen, imagine me sitting there about 25 years ago or whatever. I don't, I don't know the exact number. Matt might be able to tell you. Um, but this resume arrives in the mail from Matt Shadell. <laughs> And I started looking at this thing and his writing samples were like, they weren't like sports articles. I, no, there was one. I sent you an Anthony and Cleopatra tennis analogy article that I wrote or an essay I wrote. Is that what it was? Yeah. Like Anthony and Cleopatra and the, and the, and the C was, was the, was the net. And they kept going, you know, Anthony kept going back and forth over the net. You know, it was like the tennis ball being bounced around. Yeah. I sent you a whole, you know, you probably didn't even appreciate it. It was a brilliant article that I wrote, but it was, I didn't appreciate it, didn't I? I hired you, didn't I? You didn't send me one sports article. Yeah, I don't. You know, I don't even think you sent me a newspaper article. Back then, we were a tabloid newspaper. Yeah. He's he's applying for a hey, newspaper. You know what your now. first? You know what your first assignment you gave me was? No, I don't remember. To interview the most boring man on earth. You said, you know what? Call Paul Trangisi and do an interview with him about the Big East and how Miami, you know, whatever, whatever. I don't remember the exact details. I had to interview Paul Trangisi. He was the most boring. I couldn't even write that story. I almost quit right there. I finished that interview. I'm like, do I really want to do this job? Like this guy with a monotone voice who gave me no information other than politics talk. Like I got to write a story about this now. I don't know. I was like, this kid's really smart, hired. <laughs> you know, I figured we'll, we'll teach him sports. Um, but anyway, so it didn't, um, work, it didn't work out so well, did it? You, you... <laughs> what did you say? It didn't work out so well, did it? <laughs> You're still here by some miracle. What? How you many can't get rid of me. How many years has it been? That I graduated college. I was an intern for you for four years. I went and worked for the Baltimore Sun Community Papers, covering sports there for four years, and I was back here. So. But then remember, I split time with you and Dolphin Digest for a few years. Yeah, I came back. Yeah, I was I was evaluating my options. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but how many years has it been? Like it's been well it's, since what? Like total, including everything. Well, when did you, what year did you graduate from college? I graduated from college in '93, so I was with you from '93 to '97, and then I back again in 2001 for the. That's when I was at the Rose Bowl. So this stint is 22 years. Well, I I mean I quit for five years in between, but you didn't notice, right? But but so total time at Kane Sports like what 26, 27 years? How about that? Yeah, it's been a while. Uh, all right, listen, 
enough of that. We've got a couple of recruiting stories on but the it was, website. It was Mike, it was Mike, did I say Paul Transizzi? Mike, I said Mike Transizzi, didn't I? It, I it hope was I Mike said Mike. No, I think you said Paul, but it's I okay. said Paul. Nobody <laughs> remembers that guy. That's how bad that interview was. Nobody remembers that guy. It's been a long, it's been a long time. All right. We got a few recruiting stories on the website today, a couple by Steven. Um, there's a 2024 three-star defensive lineman named TJ Lindsay from Bryant, um, Arkansas. And then there's also a 2024 three-star tight end Dylan Hip uh, from uh, Scottsdale that uh, we write about as well today. And then Azubi's got a story on Palm Beach Gardens, Benjamin School, 2025 edge, Amari Williams. Uh, his recruitment's picking up even though he's 2025. He has a Miami offer. Make sure you check that story out as well as we continue to try to bring you stories on as many of these emerging 2024 and 2025 recruits as we can. So that's going to do it for today for Good Morning Kane Sport. We thank you so much for starting out your morning with us and and, and, and putting up with Matt. Uh, if you like this show, if you like our YouTube channel, hit your subscribe button, hit your like button. Helps us with the algorithms at YouTube, grow our audience. And if you're not yet a subscriber to canesport.com, the information is down at the bottom of the screen. Uh, we have an intro subscription special. $29.99 takes you all the way up to the start of the football season. Um, your subscriptions allow us to do what we do every day. If you're not yet a subscriber, we would love for you to join our community and our community of fans, which is absolutely amazing. It's been a little crazy this week. This coordinator search has a lot of guys uh, rat, pretty rattled, um, but uh, usually it's a lot of fun there in our message boards every single day. So for Stephen Wagner, Matt Shodell, I'm Gary Furman. Thanks again, everybody. We'll see you next time.